So a couple things. One, I wasn't even supposed to be here, so this is even more exciting. Uh, I've been working on a, a series of posts about the garbage collector for about the last six weeks, primarily because I really had no idea how it actually behaves. And I think most of us really don't understand how it behaves. So I really wanted to take the time to be able to uh, teach it properly as well. So a couple things about this talk. All right, it's going to be about the behavior of the schedule um, of the collector. It's not going to focus on implementation details, because if it did, this talk would be useless on the next version of Go, because the implementation is changing all the time. It's not it's what is important. What's important is how it behaves, so we can, you know, make sure that what we're doing in our code is sympathetic with it. The whole idea here is to make you a better Go developer. I only have 25 minutes, so unfortunately I can't do demos to show you this stuff. So this is the foundational information that we kind of have to need to get a good understanding of how the garbage collector behaves. Now, when this idea finally popped into my head, everything that I was seeing in terms of behavior and some of the tracing started to make more sense to me. So I just want to lay out this idea. Remember, we're not focused on implementation. We're focused on behavior. When you're focused on behavior, we can have models right, that help us understand that. They don't have to be 100% accurate around implementation. All right? So this first thing is don't think of the heap as a thing or as an entity. There's no linear containment of memory. It's not like that stack where we can kind of picture a block of 2K um, memory in our head. Let's just all right, there's no containment, right? You're not going to hear me say the heap, all right? Um, any memory reserved for the app, um, for the application is available for heap memory allocations. In other words, I really want you to think that the heap can almost be anywhere in that process space, okay? And we absolutely do not care where it's physically stored. That's not going to help us really better understand these behaviors. I'm just setting some ground rules up for you right now, all right? Let's just talk at a high level again, I don't care about the implementation, of what the garbage collector's responsibility is. All right? So it's got to track, right? Or tracking memory allocations in, in heap memory, uh, releasing those that are no longer in use, and then keeping the ones around that are. And it's really important that we have this collector, because when you have to do this yourself, and on top of that, write multi-threaded software, forget it. You're not spending any time solving the business problem. But this is the goal, right? This is the high-level behaviors that that collector needs to do. And this is what I want us to try to get an understanding of how all of that is done. Now, I wanted to show you a simulation of, of a mark and sweep collector. As of 1.12, Go uses a non-generational, concurrent, tri-color, mark and sweep collector. Boy, there's a lot of words there, isn't it? So if you really want to know how the implementation of that works, go right ahead. I don't think it's going to make you a better Go developer, but this is a cool kind of visualization of what a mark and sweep collector kind of looks like. And in a couple seconds, you'll see it do a quick, quick collection. All right? None of the diagrams that I present in this material will be able to do this because this is just messy and complex. But it gives you a general sense of how a mark and sweep you know, collector uh, uh, really works. Okay? But again, I want to focus on behaviors and not so much these deep implementation details. All right. So let's start with the different phases that the garbage collector has to go through. All right. There's three of them. We're going to have this mark set up, and that is a stop the world moment for your app. Basically, your application work is not getting done at all. Then there's the marking phase. That's going to be concurrent. We'll be able to work at the same time that marking is going on. And then at the end, there's another stop the world around mark termination. So you can see there's two moments of stop the world in the beginning and the end, and hopefully a lot of time in the middle doing the concurrent work. And hopefully it's not even a lot at all. We'll see some of that. All right, phase one, mark setup. The very first thing that the collector has to do is turn the right barrier on. 
It's the very first thing that has to happen. Now, the right barrier, the way I think of it, again, we're not going to go deep. We're going, to be have a, we're going to have a collector that's running concurrently with your application. It's going to be going through the heat. It's going to be going through memory that you're working with. So all of that concurrent activity has to be safe. So from my perspective, the right barrier, the way we want to think about it, the right barrier is there to make sure that all of that concurrent activity is completely safe as it's happening. So we've got to turn this right barrier on as part of this mark setup. And here's the thing. Imagine we're running on a four-threaded Go program right now. That's it. That's our CPU capacity. Four threads that can run four Go routines in parallel. The idea is to turn the right barrier on. What we have to do is stop every single Go routine from running. It's going to be very, very quick, but we have to do it. Now, what I'm showing you here is kind of a problem. The collector went ahead and said, OK, Let's stop these Go routines. And the only way that can happen is when the Go routines find themselves in a safe point. And right now, today, that safe point's only going to occur when we're inside of a function call. So now, we're waiting for function calls to happen in order to be able to get this collection started. Except, look at what I've just diagrammed on the board. We, three of those Go routines got into a function call. We were able to stop them. But one of them hasn't. This is one of the dangers that we have today, and it's something that's going to be fixed in 1.14. But right now, we're waiting. This is actually delaying some of that stop the world. Now, why would this be happening? Well, maybe that Go routine is running a piece of code like this, and that collection of integers is really, really large. There's nothing going on in this code where a function call is going to make, take place, and therefore, that Go routine is now holding everything up. So one of the things you have to remember right now to keep that application of yours healthy is that you've got to make function calls or do things in a reasonable amount of time that give the scheduler the opportunity to, in this case, you know, put that Go routine on hold. All right, so hopefully this ends at some point, and there we are. So we're now in that first stop the world where our mark setup is done. We're able to turn the right barrier on, and now we're ready for phase two. Now, phase two is where all that work is actually happening. This is that marking work. So what's, what's going on with marking here? All right. We're going to have to inspect every one of those stacks and find those root pointers back into the heap. Then we're going to have to traverse the heap graph from those pointers. And the idea is to mark every single value in the heap that are in use. All right. So this is our goal. We've got to do all of that. We've got to traverse the entire heap, mark everything that's in use, and we've got to try to do that um, within a reasonable amount of time. So, guess what? The garbage collector uses Go routines just like we do, right? And so that means that the garbage collector needs some of those M's or threads in order to do their work. So what the garbage collector is going to do is take 25% of your CPU capacity. So in this particular case, there's four threads. It's going to take one entirely to itself to do all of that marking work. So there we are. I decided to take P1. OK. But what happens if the collector begins to realize that it might run out of memory, memory that it's set as its limit, before that collection gets to finish? We were only using one thread. Maybe there's another Go routine out of those three that is starting to allocate a little bit more than was expected. We can't allow that to happen. So what the collector is going to do is want to start to slow down allocations. And it's going to choose the Go routine that's allocating the most to start helping in the marking work. We're going to call that a mark assist. Now, the amount of time that Go routines in a mark assist is, is going to be proportional to the amount of allocation that's going on during that time. All right? But we're going to see, especially on, on applications that are allocating heavy, mark assist time during the garbage collection. All right, so that that means is we're now in this situation here. Maybe that Go routine on P3 has now been placed into this mark assist. It's going to be for a very short time, but it's, it's going to happen if the collector feels that it has to slow 
down allocation. All right, so we've got some Marcus's time going on as well here during this concurrent phase. All right, phase three, Mark termination. This is that stop the world at the end. And what's happening now is we're going to turn that right barrier uh, off. Remember, we turned it on. Now we're going to turn it off. We're going to uh, do some various cleanup tasks. And then that next goal that we're going to talk about soon is calculating. So the idea, from my experience, or the idea is we want to try to keep that stop the world down to about 100 microseconds on every collection, where the first one tends to happen within 10 to 30 microseconds and the other one around, let's say, 60 to 90 microseconds, depending on what's going on. Right? That's the goal. Regardless of the size of the heap, that's the goal on, on every collection. Right? So we're trying to get that done. All right, so we've got these phases now. We have, a, we have a clear kind of picture of what's going on, and there's that stop the world again at the end because we've got to, we've got to do all of that activity. All right, so we've got a, 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 an idea now of what's going on, and once the collection is done, this is where we're back to, right? Now we're running full throttle again. Now we're running full throttle. So remember that, right? As the collector's running, we are running concurrently, but it's not until that collection is over again do we get back to using our full CPU capacity on our machine. Okay. So the collection's done. What happens next? Now the sweeping starts to happen. The sweeping is reclaiming all of that memory, all those values that were not marked as in use. We've got to get that memory back. And so it's the time um, to do that. Now, what's interesting is I didn't put this into the phase of garbage collection because this actually happens outside of garbage collection. It actually happens when your Go routines start trying to allocate new values in heat memory. That's when it's happening. The cost really isn't to the garbage collection. It's going to be on the, on the new allocation. All right? So take a quick look at a trace. From the, from the tracer. There's a few interesting things going on here that you'll see that I've kind of talked to you about already. Up here in this blue area right here, you're seeing the very end of a, of a uh, collection. That blue area is showing us the, the, right, the end of that mark marking and, and mark termination. And I want you to notice that I'm on a 12, I have 12 threads running on this machine. So I can run 12 go routines in parallel. You can see three of those are now dedicated to GC, just like that 25% that we talked about. You can also see that I've got three go routines down here in here in that mark assist work. You see that? You see that block underneath each go routine that's telling us within this scope of time that go routine has been asked to do some marking work on our behalf. And then near the very end of this collection, if you look down here, you see that STW, stop the world, there's that mark termination that we talked about there at the end. Now, once the collection's over, if you notice, we've got some go routines over here. They're starting to run full throttle again, except you see all these rose-colored lines underneath? That's that sweeping that's happening. So now these go routines are off trying to do some allocation and they're getting into this sweeping phase. In fact, if you take a look at, if you click on any one of those sweeps, you start to see the stack trace on the malloc GC call, which is allocate memory, and then you see that next call, next free, and, and that's what's happening. So the sweep is actually happening after the collection while that app starts to begin to try to create some new allocations in heap memory. Interesting. Okay. So these are the behaviors of the garbage collector, and we talked about how that's happening on those threads that we have to run all of the work. Go has this, this configuration option that's part of the runtime. It's called the GC percentage. And it's, it's a, a, an important and interesting number as it relates to collections. The GC percentage by default is set to 100, which represents 100%. And this is, the, this is the interesting part. This is some of the stuff that I really struggled over the last few weeks to really understand. This number represents a ratio between how much new heat memory can be allocated before the next collection has to start. It's interesting. 
It's how much new memory is allowed to be allocated before we must start the next collection. And there's an environmental variable named GOGC that lets us change it, but I'm going to try to show you why you don't want to touch it. Now, I just got a quick disclaimer here. I already showed you a, an animation of a mark and sweep collector. I'm going to give you some diagrams of heat memory that are completely inaccurate in terms of how they really are going to be handled in, our, uh, in memory. But it, it doesn't matter. I'm trying to give you some mental models of how things work. I want you to understand that. So imagine after a collection, this is where we're at. Imagine that we're left with two megs of memory that is currently in use on the heap by this application. What GOGC set to 100 now means is that next collection doesn't really have to start until there's another two meg of new allocations that are made. And the collector is going to be monitoring that. All right? If you end up with that four meg amount, if you end up with four megs of memory that are in use, then the 100% says, we'll allow another four meg of allocations to occur before we have to start another collection. Now, again, a heap is not this clean, all right? but we're able to track allocations. Now, let's talk about GC trace for a second, because it's a good way of kind of visualizing and seeing that GC percent in action. So I have a running application that I will have in a second post demoing everything that you're seeing. So here's a, a, a trace of that application. And you're looking at the uh, 14th, 105th uh, trace right there. And this is what a, a trace looks like. Let me break this down for you so you can get a sense of what these numbers. Have you ever seen a, a GOGC trace before? And all you have to do is set the go debug variable to GC trace one and run your app like I'm doing there at the top. And this will start being produced to standard error uh, every time a garbage collection occurs. So let's just break this down. What we're looking at on these three values is how many times the GC's run since the program started, how many seconds in we are. And this number is really interesting. 11% of the available CPU so far has been spent in GC. So this is a number that's going to be growing over time. It's a cumulative number, okay? But part of what this code is doing is running a load of 10,000 requests through the server. I like to do that. I'll restart the programs, get it ready, and run a load. And I'll know how many collections it took and how much GC percent was required to do that particular load. These are interesting numbers that can help us better understand our software. All right, the next three numbers. This is telling us the three phases, the three phases of collection. The amount of stop the world time on both ends, that mark start and mark termination. And again, when we add that up, hopefully it's under 100 microseconds. We're very, very close. And then here you can see the concurrent time. This is an application I'm showing you that allocates pretty heavily. All right, so these are good numbers. You see the pluses there because if we add them all up, then you have the total GC time for that particular trace. Okay, cool. So these are good numbers. Then you've got um, the same kind of thing at the CPU clock. Honestly, I tend to stay here at the wall clock and not look at these numbers. But what's nice is in the middle, it kind of breaks up some of the different phases of the concurrent, the concurrent part of uh, marking. All right, these are really the numbers I want to talk about. Because this is giving us information about what's happening in our heap memory. So that first number is telling us that um, before the collection started, we had 7 megs of memory currently in use. Currently in use. Then after the marking finished, when all that marking work was done, the heap grew an extra 4 meg to 11 because we're running concurrently, right? So there's going to be allocations happening while we're doing the marking. And in this particular trace, four meg of memory was allocated during the marking. But this is the cool number, that last number, six meg. What this is saying is, if the sweep could happen right now, immediately, 
what you would really be left with is six megs of memory in use. That's what the collector was able to do, get us down really to six megs of in-use memory after everything was done. All right? But you're not going to get to six meg right away after the, after the marking because you still have to go through the heat process. And while the heat process, or while the sweep, sorry, process is going on, what's happening? You're also allocating already. But it's the six meg that the GC percent is what's going to bind itself to. So since the six meg there is set as what's in use, that means that we get to allocate another six meg of memory before the collector has to run again. So that GC percent is based on that third number right there. Okay. Then we've got the goal of the collector before the collection even starts. The collector is trying to set a goal of what the heap should look like after the concurrent marking phase is done. So it's also trying to figure out how much more memory growth are we going to end up having all right, when this thing is done. And then you can see that I'm running on 12, 12 threads. So here's kind of a visual, give you a visual idea of what we're looking at here. So on that trace that we looked at, right, the goal was a 10, kind of went a meg over the goal, but there was four megabytes of extra, you know, new allocations during the, the collection. And we end up now with the ability to allocate another six meg before a collection has to start again. Now, this app is allocating pretty heavy. So about two milliseconds later, this is the next trace. You can see the goal was a little higher, and, and, and the collector made that goal underneath it by two. You could see something really interesting. It had 12 meg before it had to collect, but it actually started the collection at eight. And this is an interesting point. The collector can start a collection early if it feels like it's going to benefit the application. That's exactly what happened here. Now, why maybe in this case did it happen? It could have happened because it, it felt like, well, let's talk about pacing, and then I'll show you there. It'll be better. So, there's a pacing algorithm that's trying to figure out, okay, when do we actually start the next collection? I've already told you either we've used up that 100% more, or the collector decides what? I'm going to start a collection early. It's going to make some determination. So we've got the pacing algorithm here. It's gathering information in a feedback loop, and it's trying to identify the stress that's happening on the app. How much memory are we allocating, and how quickly is that happening? So there's a cadence to the pace, right? I showed you that between those two traces before, there was a two millisecond gap between those two paces. There's, there's a cadence that's going to occur. But we understand something. Every time the collection runs, this is the key, right? This is the key to everything. I only got a minute, so I apologize. This is the key to everything. Every time the collection runs, there's going to be some latency cost on your app. There's going to be some latency cost on your app. One of the big misconceptions that a lot of people have is, well, if every time the, the collection runs, there's a latency cost, then maybe I can slow down the pace and reduce the latency cost. Right? That, that's a mis, misunderstanding. The idea is, well, I won't set it to 100. I'll set it to 500. Then there'll be 36 meg of allocations that I can have before the next collection starts. If I slow down the pace and a collection doesn't hit, run, then I'm not taking the latency cost. This is really absolutely not what you want to do. What we really want to do, if you really want to help the pacing algorithm and, and all this collection, is we really want to reduce the number or the amount of allocation that we're doing at any given time. This is what we need to do. This is a, an example of the app. On the bottom is when it's running original. The top is when I reduce the allocations almost 4.5 gig of allocations over 10,000 requests. What I want you to notice here, what's important here, is the pace of the, of the garbage collections, which is this arrow. I want you to notice, even though we reduced a large amount of memory from one version to the other, even though we've reduced the, the duration that the program runs and, and the um, number of collections that ran, 
The pace stayed the same. The pace stayed the same. And because of that, we were able to run. We were able to get more work done between each garbage cart. This is what I want you to, to really take away from this. What we're really trying to do is not slow down the pace. We're trying to get more work done in between that pace. That's the goal here when we're looking at reducing those allocations. All right? So real quick, this is the latency cost for your program every time, that collect, every time the collection starts. As soon as the collection starts, right? in this case, my application work is only at 75% CPU capacity. We're giving up 25%. Also, when that mark assist is working, even though this is a short burst, right? Now we're only running at 50%. So there's that latency cost. And then you have to stop the world. This is the cost. So what I really want us to do, what I really want you to focus on is trying to find those non-productive allocations. Not to slow down the pace, but to try to give the collector the ability, the ability to get as much work done as we can during and, and before each one. Not slow it down, run it full throttle, but let's just get more work done before and during. And we do that by just finding allocations that we can remove. All right? If I had time, I could show you a demo of doing all of this. But this is our foundational information about how to think about the collector. This is the foundational stuff. This is going to give you the mental models so when you are running your, that, that profile and you're looking at GOGC traces and all that, you can start to kind of picture in your head what's going on. All right, hopefully this has helped all of you a little bit, get a better understanding of how the garbage collector works. Thanks for listening to me for almost 30 minutes. I, thank you.